Today on Twin Cam, I'm lucky enough to be in the presence of these two lovely 1980s Minis. To my left is a 1983 Austin Mini City, the most basic Mini you could buy in period. And to my right is a much posher 1985 Austin Mini Mayfair. And this is one of my favourite periods in Mini history. So today we're going to study what happened to the Mini when it was relieved of its duties as British Leyland's volume small car following the launch of the Austin Metro in October 1980. Before we begin, both of these cars are currently for sale at Stockley Classics, so if you'd like a little bit of British motoring history, then please do follow the link in the description. The Mini is probably Britain's favourite classic car, but it hasn't always been viewed that way. Certainly by the late 1970s, this little thing had been its parent company's volume small car for 20 years. Having said that, they had tried to replace it a handful of times. The most famous proposal being the 9X project of 1967, masterminded by the designer of the original, Sir Alec Isagonis. But this incredibly clever little car was a non-starter, as BMC, as the company was then known, didn't have either the money or the will to put the 9X into production. And it's questionable as to whether it would have emulated the success of the Mini at all. So the safe bet was to bin it. At the end of the day, the Mini was still selling fantastically well, a trait not shared with all of its BMC peers. So its replacement was far down the list of priorities. The Longbridge factory produced over 318,000 Minis in 1971, the car's best ever year. But 71 was also the last year that the Mini didn't have a deadly serious competitor. 1972 saw the real beginnings of the Super Mini revolution, with the Renault 5 joining the Autobianchis and Fiats at the forefront of the European market. The Mini may have remained popular, but it began to be seriously outclassed, and as the 1970s progressed, more and more manufacturers joined the party, including the one that, in the UK, had the power to seriously upset BL. Ford. In 1976, the European arm of the Blue Oval stuck a dagger into Britain's nationalised giant's heart, in the shape of the Ford Fiesta. Amazingly, the Mini actually outsold the Fiesta between 1977 and 1980, but the reality of the Mini's age is illustrated very clearly through the reviews, and I have here Motor Magazine's 1977 Road Test Annual featuring a section on the Mini Clubman Saloon. They describe the car as noisy, unrefined and bumpy, and though it remained very practical for its size, it was simply smaller than the likes of the Fiesta, Fiat 127, Renault 5 and Volkswagen Polo. And more importantly, it still didn't have a hatchback. All this meant that British Leyland had a bit of a task on their hands. They had to replicate the success of the Mini in a completely new form to retake their position at the pinnacle of the small car market. Of course, that idea eventually became the Austin Metro. But in the process of creating that new car, BL had to take a good hard look at the Mini and the classic satin. Minis are tiny. Everybody knows that. And if you look back at my video about the Mini's initial development and launch back in the late 1950s, then you'll see that it was designed to overtake the microcar. Stuff like the Assetta and Messerschmitt. And it essentially destroyed that whole segment, introducing a whole new segment of its own, the modern city car. But by the late 1970s, the city car market was slowly thinning out as the Mini's emulators had all grown up rather significantly, creating another new market segment, with cars we know in the UK as Super Minis. That name is derived from these little cars I'm surrounded by today, and that caused a bit of a fuss when BL was developing the Metro. By 1977, the prototyping stage was well underway for the new car, then known as ADO 88. 
It was very much a mini replacement and, as a result, was far smaller than the modern Super Minis. And when they took this shape to the design clinics, it was met with despair. People hated it. They thought it was slab-sided and lacked personality, and this problem arose from the dimensions. In order to make ADO-88 as practical as possible within mini-like dimensions, it was effectively a box on wheels. And this harsh reality made the company completely rethink its objectives. The decision was made to comprehensively redesign ADO-88's body shell, morphing the car into both something more attractive and something bigger to compete directly with the likes of the Fiesta. What BL was now designing was a Super Mini, not a new Mini. And that had a knock-on effect that changed the course of the original's history. As the Metro wouldn't replace the Mini directly, BL decided to keep it in production as a cheaper alternative. But going down that route meant that the Mini range needed some serious reorganising. For an economy car in the late 1970s, the Mini had a pretty big range. At the bottom was the entry-level Mini City with its 850cc engine, followed by an 850 Super and 1000, the poshest of the traditional round-nose Minis. Then was the Roy Haynes designed square-fronted Mini Clubman Saloon, alongside its lengthened brother, the Mini Clubman Estate, both with 1100cc engines in manual form and 1000cc engines if automatics. Finally, there was the hot-ish Mini 1275 GT, complete with alloy wheels and 70s-tastic decals. That means there were five main trim levels, four engine capacities, and three body styles, not to mention the commercial variants. So the pruning that went on following the Metro's launch in October 1980 was pretty severe. The only surviving model was the basic Mini City, like this one and above it sat the new Mini HL Saloon, combining Clubman-style trim with the traditional round-nose front end. They did also keep the estate, rechristened as the Mini HL Estate, but unlike the saloon, it kept going with the Clubman nose. But it wouldn't surprise me for someone to question why. Why would BL keep a 21-year-old car with small profit margins that was difficult to build in production? Well, there are two reasons further than the fact that the Mini was smaller than the Metro. First, BL hadn't always done particularly well with its new cars during the 70s, and so keeping the Mini in production was a way of hedging their bets that if, heaven forbid, the Metro failed, the Mini would be there in the background to pick up the pieces. And secondly, that the Mini's the Mini. Although horrendously outdated, it still has that inalienable character and tenaciousness that made it such a success in the first place. And that, I feel, is the key to understanding the Mini in the 1980s. Without the constraints of being continuously compared to Super Minis, the Mini could be the Mini again. BL, Austin Morris or Austin Rover, depending on what they wanted to call themselves that week, could market these cars completely unapologetically. It was a classic in its own time and almost immediately after the Metro was launched, the Mini's marketing became punctuated by comments about Alec Isagonis, about its Monte Carlo rally wins back in the 60s and about the loving that this country had with these tiny cars. That change was immediate. But the slow growth into a cult classic is something that we'll discuss in a moment. So what did BL do to drag its baby into another new decade? Well, the 1980 facelift saw some minis gain all new trim, replacing most of the chrome with grey. The new minis had grey grills, grey bumpers, grey door handles and grey mirrors, as well as a whole new suite of colours and new plastic wheel trims. They gained the new brand identity too, with the earlier badge reappearing on the bonnet. All these features are present on this Mini Mayfair, a luxurious model introduced a few years after the refresh, and it has coach lines and decals and all that good stuff to drag it into being at least an acceptable mode of 80s transport. 
The interior too is transformed from 1959, with soft materials surrounding the dash rails, head restraints atop the front seats, a smaller three-spoke steering wheel, and instruments in front of the driver, including a tachometer, because that's something a 1.0-litre Mini really requires. The Mini City I have here is a 1983 model, and that fact is key, because here it retains many of the Mini's original features, including the trim strip in place of wheel arch extensions, little 10-inch wheels, drum brakes, basic seating, a bus-like steering wheel, and the famous central speedometer. And though this one has been retrofitted with a bit of chrome and a rather garish blue carpet, it represents the final hurrah for some of the Mini's original character traits. But overall, the changes are simple facelift fodder, keeping the car looking and feeling somewhat up to date. But the statement of intent from BL was what they did to the Mini under the skin. A few months before the Metro's launch, BL added a whole new sound deadening package, and this helped transform the refinement of the car, as before this, Minis had virtually no sound deadening. And that point was the major problem Motor Magazine had with the car back in 77. But once this was in place, the cars had foam absolutely everywhere, attempting to keep resonance and road noise to a minimum. Just take this diagram as an example of how much they added. The Mini also benefited from the engineering that went into the Metro, as although the Mini was now limited to just 998cc across the range, it received the re-engineered A+. Now, although it looks the same, barring the colourful engine blocks, the A+, has a stronger block and crank, with lighter pistons and a raft of other improvements, eventually including new carburettors, that meant it was more reliable, longer lasting, more refined, more fuel efficient, and could go longer between services. But following this Metro launch facelift and the interior changes for later 80s cars like this Mayfair, the mechanical changes continue to follow suit. Ever since its launch all the way back in 1959, run-of-the-mill minis always had the 10-inch wheels and little drum brakes of the city. But for 1984, Austin Rover decided to finally upgrade the brakes to 8.4-inch discs nabbed from the Metro, and the wheels to 12 inches, as well as adding little plastic wheel arch extensions. But as I've alluded to, this isn't particularly abstract stuff. Keeping an old model going with bits from the new car isn't unheard of, but it provides a vital stepping stone to a Mini that we'll be looking at soon, with one of the cars that kick-started the Mini's revival, the comeback of the Cooper. But back to our period, and the 1970s was BL's worst decade. It saw an almost complete market collapse, its nationalisation, and a number of poorly received models. But the Mini continue to sell incredibly well. I've already mentioned it, but the fact that the Mini actually outsold any of the Super Minis in the 70s is testament to its brilliance and people's confidence in it. I don't think it would be too far-fetched to say that the Mini was the only reason that BL kept going through the 70s. Without this brilliant little car holding sales up for so long, it's doubtful that the Metro would have been able to launch. And it's doubtful that the Mini brand would survive to this day. In 1979, BL produced 165,000 Minis. In 1981, they produced 70,000. And by 1985, only 34,000 Minis were produced at Longbridge. The Metro obliterated Mini sales figures, making it a niche car to buy brand new overnight. But this was the catalyst, as well as the passing of time, that allowed the Mini to return to its cultural icon status, to become a character car, and through the following decade, to become a car bought purely for its personality and its style. But that's a story for another video, hopefully soon. So on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to Twincam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos 
coming along soon.